Welcome to Friday Forum. I'm Bobby Regan, Chair of the City Club's Forum Board. For more than 100 years, City Club of Portland is where civic-minded people have come together to find solutions to our region's biggest challenges. Today, we're a diverse network of people who are eager to learn, connect, and share ideas for a better Oregon. Thank you for joining us at the Centennial Hotel in downtown Portland, where thousands of people are joining us online, on the radio, and on TV. Live viewers are watching on KGW's website, Facebook feed, and news app. Our radio audience is listening via X-ray, FM stations, 107.1 FM and 91.1 FM. And TV viewers will watch today's program via open signals, community media television stations. We are incredibly grateful for the support of our media partners in bringing City Club forums to our community. In addition to City Club's valued media partners, our volunteers and staff enable us to put on Oregon's best civic programs week after week. I'd especially like to recognize the Multnomah County Aging, Disability, and Veterans Services Division for sponsoring today's forum. Please join me in showing our appreciation to everyone who has made this event possible. The City of Portland and Multnomah County are designated by the World Health Organization as part of the global network of age-friendly cities and communities. But what does that designation mean? Are attitudes and perceptions in our region friendly to all generations? Are the infrastructure, public spaces, and civic institutions in our community welcoming and inclusive? And how can we generally do a better job of making our communities more age-friendly? We have a great panel here today to help us answer these questions and a lot more. Adam Davis is a co-founder and partner of DHM Research, a nonpartisan opinion research firm. Adam has worked on many research projects across multiple sectors, including the recent Values and Beliefs Across Generations study, which he presented at the 2016 Aging in America Conference in Washington, D.C. Joining Adam is Alan Della Torre, a research associate at Portland State University's Institute on Aging, where he coordinates the Senior Adult Learning Center and co-coordinates the Age-Friendly Portland and Multnomah County Initiative. A self-described urban gerontologist, Alan serves as chair of the Age-Friendly Design Committee for the Academy for Gerontology and Higher Education and as treasurer for the Oregon Gerontological Association. Moderating our discussion today, is Ruby Houghton Pitts, the State Director for AARP Oregon. Graduate of the University of Oregon, Ruby recently returned to Oregon after serving as the Director of Outreach and Advocacy for AARP Illinois. Please join me in welcoming our guests. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to be here. And like I always tell people, it's a pleasure to be home. So thank you for welcoming me home. The first thing I want to tell you is I came back to Oregon because AERP is doing a reframe. Oftentimes people think about us as the retirement organization. That's not who we are anymore because people don't traditionally retire anymore. And the topic that we are going to move towards today really is near and dear to my heart because it takes me to that area and that space of how to build an age-friendly city. And Portland, I believe, is prime for this. City Club is prime for this, and we are prime for this. I want you to think about AARP in a different frame today. I want you to think about the fact that if we are focusing on people who are 50 plus and their families, we've got people who are right there in the sandwich generation, who are raising children, working hard every day. They've got children at home. They may even have parents at home. And they may be also caring for parents and grandparents. AARP is in the position of helping us to live our best lives now in that 50 plus in our family space. And that's really what we want, we're gonna talk about today having to do with building an age-friendly community. So let me tell you something good that happened to me yesterday. 
Yesterday, we had the opportunity to receive from Governor Brown an age-friendly proclamation. On Monday, you will be able to see far and wide, I've already done some media, um, you'll be able to see far and wide throughout our land of Oregon that we love so much that AARP has done with Governor Brown um, a proclamation naming Monday, um, the 3rd of June, the actual start of everything that we're going to be doing to make Oregon much more age friendly. That proclamation hopefully will start a process across the state. Even though here in Portland we got started early, and I, I'm very proud of that, um, but it will start a process across the state that will actually have us focusing on eight domains throughout the state to make every community, every neighborhood in the state of Oregon more livable for people as they age. So when I talk about that and people say, so what do you mean? What are you talking about? Where are we going? What are we doing? Um, I want you to think about a community where transportation is good. Great, in fact. Where you've actually been a part of designing that. So that as you age, whether you're a child, whether you're middle-aged, or whether you're elderly, the transportation in your community works for you. We also want housing to work for us. Right now, my husband and I own a brownstone in Chicago that's five bedrooms, four bathrooms. It's just us. We don't need that anymore. It's time to step down into something smaller and let somebody with a big family move in there and take care of that property. So we're gonna be moving out of that house and moving here in Portland, and we're gonna live in something smaller because it's time. It's, ch it's time to change. We want our public spaces to be accommodating to each and every one of us. And we wanna be able to work out in our community, to walk, to be safe. We want all of those things to take place in our Oregon. And that's why I'm back, and that's why AARP is changing focus with a big umbrella and a big tent that says we want our communities to be age-friendly, and we also want each and every one of you to be a part of what we're doing. So as we're kind of moving along today, I don't want to take up too much time because your speakers today are amazing individuals, but I do want each and every one of you to take the time to get to know the new AARP. Um, I want to do just a little shout out to my team, um, Bandana Shrestha, who is our livable communities expert in the state of Oregon. Elaine um, Friesen-Strand, who's a, a livable expert and our statewide president. And Joyce Demonen, who's our communications director, who literally sends things out. And all of our volunteers that are sitting in this room and spending good time with us. So definitely, as, as time goes on, I hope to get a chance to get to know you better. And I will definitely be at City Club, and our membership will be current as always. So thank you very much. So let's kind of move along here. I'm going to go sit down and be quiet so that we can hear from folks. Do you want to come on up? Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Ruby. Uh, great introduction and overview of how age-friendly communities go to the core of the mission for the new AARP. I'm going to take us uh, from ground level up to 50,000 feet uh, and talk briefly about values and beliefs before Alan takes us back down to ground level and we have our discussion. Uh, as an opinion researcher, I consider the topic of age-friendly communities what I call a gateway umbrella issue or topic one that can touch the hearts and minds of a large and diverse group of people, unlike many other issues or topics. Like the topic public health or the public's health, it involves many issues and semantically captures the attention of many different people, makes an emotional connection with them, piques their interests, and can spark their engagement. 
When we at DHM Research asked Oregonians what they like most about living in Oregon, the very top responses among all age groups relate to the livability and quality of life they have in their communities, including the sense of community and neighborliness. Yet in the same surveys, we measure great anxiety, again, among all age groups, about the livability and quality of life they'll have in their communities in the future, emanating from a variety of social, economic, and environmental concerns, ranging from equity, diversity, and inclusion, and unemployment and underemployment to traffic congestion and affordable housing and health care. So the future of our communities for Oregonians of all ages, we're all getting older, everyone, is an important planning and public policy topic, and I welcome the opportunity to tee it up with Ruby and Alan with a brief overview of values and beliefs related to making Oregon communities more livable for young and old. The timing for this quick uh, overview is perfect thanks to the YARG Foundation and the Coalition of Oregon Land Trusts, which recently completed the Oregon Voices Project, the most in-depth statewide values and beliefs research since the 2013 Oregon Values and Beliefs Study, which was sponsored by the Oregon Community Foundation, Oregon Public Broadcasting, Oregon Health and Science University, and Oregon State University. So only a few minutes, so let me touch on some findings from the Colt work and some DHM research findings. What is it specifically that Oregonians value about their community? In response to an open-ended question in the Colt survey, along with the sense of community and neighborliness I mentioned, other top mentions for all age groups include an environmental quality, the natural beauty, low or no crime, and low population. Another open-ended question in the cold survey was, what is the most important issue in your community that you want leaders to do something about? Pouring through hundreds of responses resulted in 20 coding categories, including education, economic growth, drug issues, and the mental health system mentioned more than any other issue by all age groups as important for community leaders to do something about was poverty and homelessness. Other top mentions included affordable housing and environmental protection. Offering some validation of these findings was a close-ended question in the cold survey that asked Oregonians to rate their satisfaction level for where they live with 14 different quality of life factors, ranging from schools and the educational system and safety from crime to the economy and trails and parks. Oregonians of all ages are most satisfied with parks and places for outdoor recreation and least satisfied with homelessness, services, and housing affordability. In a DHM research project we worked on with uh, PSU and AARP a few years ago, we learned that very important to Oregonians 45 years old and older in making age-friendly communities are health services and a healthcare system that focuses on wellness and healthy living instead of just treating disease. Staying in one's own home or community is important to meeting the needs of seniors and people with disabilities, as are maintaining financial independence and preserving personal choice in how one is served. Now, zeroing in on something that has been an issue for the City Club and many organizations, equity. In a companion national survey with PSU and AARP of 1,139 U.S. residents, this question was asked. People of color, people with disabilities, and women often experience unequal treatment, lack of fairness, or discrimination, which are termed equity issues. Do you feel age is also an equity issue? That is, people can also experience inequity as a result of their age. 82% said yes. Responses were asked to comment and employment was among the top equity concerns. Last week, an AP survey reported that 60% of older Americans see workplace discrimination. 
considering older Americans are living longer, living healthier longer, and many are not prepared for retirement and need the work, this is significant. And a few words about the values and beliefs of baby boomers and millennials in Oregon, the two generations the media is mentioning most often. So strap yourselves in. A majority of baby boomers believe millennials expect a trophy for everything and are overly obsessed with technology and social media. Even the millennials themselves believe the latter. <laughs> baby boomers, how about you? Well, a majority of millennials believe you are a drain on the nation's resources and a burden for future generations and you are responsible for the problems we have today. It will take the generations working together as we all age to have age-friendly communities. So there is a need to rise above these attitudes about each other, recognize the good in each other that as I've presented, we share many of the same values and beliefs related to the future of communities and work together if we are to be successful. There are some building blocks here. For example, large numbers of baby boomers feel millennials are empathetic and guided by principles and will make the world a better place. And millennials, large numbers feel baby boomers donate money and volunteer time to help individuals and organizations to be more successful. One final point. Many baby boomers also feel millennials are not interested in politics. If voting is an indication, they're right, considering that younger Oregonians are not voting at all near the rate of older Oregonians. A big concern millennials and Generation Z should have is that a subgroup of older Oregonians, and importantly, importantly, a subgroup that's not even representative of all older Oregonians, are in many ways calling the shots when it comes to the kind of age-friendly communities they'll have as they and their children uh, grow older. So that's it. At 50,000 feet, I'm going to hand it over to Alan to bring us back down to ground level. Please. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'd like to start by saying thank you to Ruby for her leadership and for cracking the age-friendly Oregon nut. Uh, we've kind of We've got here, finally, we're, we've got momentum. This is amazing. Adam, for your collaboration and uh, continued patience with, with us as well. Uh, also, for City Club for hosting us here, this is really quite important. And for those of you, my friends and colleagues in the audience, I really appreciate your support and what you've done for us over, over time for aging in the community here. Um, I'm actually going to try to go from the global to the local, talking about the work we've been doing um, with the WHO down to AARP and then into Portland. But I'm going to start in my home. I think it's the best place to go from here. I moved to Portland in 2002 to start graduate studies at Portland State University. I've grown up in this community. I, moved, I met my wife here. I've had my children here. This summer, my parents and my grandmother will move here, and at that time, we'll have four generations spanning 90 years in this community. I expect to grow old here, and if I'm lucky, to die here too. My kids will grow up here, and I'm home. Even though I've only been here for 17 years, this is the longest place that I've lived to date. Professionally, we label the work we're doing as an age-friendly community or moving toward age-friendly community. But I, before I get into the background of what age-friendly is, I really want to give some uh, background and, and really shout out to the work that's been happening on creating an age-friendly community and a community for all generations. So for the last 40 years, the Institute on Aging at Portland State has been serving this community. Doctors Chapman, Howe, and Baggett wrote my professional Bible at the time in 1994 called Creating a Society for, oh, let me get this right, Planning for an Aging Society. Karen Brown Wilson, who is also a mentor and a colleague of mine, started the assisted living movement here. We have a history of making communities for all ages and, and great for age-friendly planning as well. Portland has and must continue to lead the way. And 12 and a half years ago, Margaret Neal, Dr. Margaret Neal, who's in the audience here, my mentor, a friend of mine, 
came to us with a, an opportunity. She said, the WHO reached out to us and asked if we were interested in becoming part of a global research project. It was interesting at the time, um, I didn't really know much about budgets and what it took to execute a research project, but it was an unreasonable and shocking request. Complete this project in five months with a budget of zero dollars. <laughs> Right, so at the time I jumped at the opportunity as a graduate student, it was an amazing opportunity to really work towards something that I was already doing, which is urban gerontology or the, the confluence of, of aging gerontology and urban studies. So we jumped at the opportunity. I think it was important and we were the first U.S. city to be involved in the global age-friendly cities movement. And this is something that we'll always have kind of claim to, which is really quite exciting. We worked our tails off. We finished the report on the flight to London in the spring of 2007, sitting next to a couple of colleagues of ours who later told us, you kind of kept us awake. <laughs> <laughs> For the next few years, we did what academics do. We disseminated, we talked to people who were interested. We went to city hall, we went to town halls. We went to conferences, local, at the state level, at, at the national and international levels as well. Around 2010, the WHO had had a clamoring for more cities to get involved in this project. They said, we want in too. 33 cities in 22 countries is not enough, and everyone's aging in every part of the world. So the WHO created a global network for age-friendly cities and communities, of which Portland was one of the first nine. Around 10 years ago, AARP became in charge of our, na our national efforts around age-friendly communities. We've been leading and really working toward trying to make the United States and our local communities and state age friendly. AARP has, as of this morning, uh, 373 members in the global or in the US age friendly network. And the WHO has thousands of other communities across the world that are doing work that's really important, advancing communities for all ages and abilities. Let me take a step back. This is where we get a, to go from the global down to the local. So what is it exactly that we're doing here? And I know that we'll get a chance to dig into some questions from the audience, but I really wanted to paint the picture here of how things have evolved since we joined the global and national network of age-friendly communities. So we've had a wonderful advisory council of which there are some members here in the audience. Uh, that advisory council wrote an action plan for an age-friendly Portland. Multnomah County also followed suit and has an action plan for an age-friendly Multnomah County. We have created five committees that are, are active and moving forward in various capacities and, and at different speeds. I think I, it must be important to note that housing, transportation, civic participation and volunteering, employment and the economy, and health services prevention and equity. These are our operational committees, the things that we're doing to move the work forward. More recently, we've started exploring ways to increase age equity and intergenerational activities. We've held events focusing on aging well and celebrating businesses that are both good employers for older adults and that as businesses are doing good things for our communities, making our communities more age friendly in a number of ways. If the city's budget holds true next month, the city of Portland will hire an age friendly city government employee to move our city to become more age friendly. I'll leave you with one last thought, and I'm going to channel my friend Jay Bloom, who I think is watching or listening from far away. A community that is good for older adults and, and children is a community that's good for all of us. We must continue to build a community for all ages. That is, all ages that are here now, but the generations that come next. This is a sustainable question. It's a sustainable effort that we need to make because Demography is destiny. We are aging at a rapid and unprecedented rate, and our window for preparing is closing rapidly. Strangely enough, this is the same message that was uh, said last decade, and even some of the literature from 30, 40, 50 years ago understood that the baby boomers were aging and that we needed to begin preparing. I think it's important to note that I am uh, in the middle of the two generations Adam mentioned, right? So as a Gen Xer, I get to sit on the sidelines in some of these generational conflicts. But really the solution is that we're all a part of this. This is not about us versus them. We are all aging because the alternative is not so great. <laughs> I, I hope you, to, to answer some more questions about the inside parts of the initiative uh, moving forward. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Alan. For our radio audience out there, this is City Club of Portland's Friday's Friday Forum. I'm Ruby Houghton-Pitts, State Director of AARP Oregon. 
I'm here today with Adam Davis of DHM Research and Alan De La Torre from Portland State's Institute on Aging. We're going to move now to our Q&A um, time together. Um, if you do have a question, we'd like you to line up at the microphone um, over on my left, your right. And we're going to talk a little bit while you all are repositioning yourselves. So let me start out the questioning, if you don't mind, um, <laughs> with just a few little things. Okay. Um, and let me go to you first, um, Adam. When it comes to communications with Oregonians about age-friendly communities, what are some of the considerations related to Oregonians' values and beliefs that you really think we need to take home with us today? Some things that um, I would recommend is letting people know where the leadership is coming from for any particular initiative. I think that's key. And what I'm finding is people being very receptive to partnerships. And particularly partnerships between the nonprofit sector and uh, uh, the um, public sector. What's so cool about what I see going on in the age-friendly arena is that you have those partnerships. Toot them, okay? People want to hear that. Uh, the uh, negativity around uh, uh, private sector uh, initiatives, uh, solely public sector uh, initiatives is there. The uh, only other thing I would mention be because of time is the word grandparents. In communications, say grandparents. I hear uh, a lot about parents, I hear a lot about family, young people, the youth, but uh, grandparents, uh, real important to keep in mind when you're talking and trying to connect with people. Excellent. Alan, you want to touch that? Yeah, I, I'd love to just give a, a little thought. So I talk to my students about this sometimes. The, the language we use is really important in how we frame aging. And one real interesting difference, right, if we use the term elderly versus elder, right, a small change to the end of that word, we go from a connotation which would be kind of frail and in need of help to somebody who might be wise and giving help, right? So language matters in a lot of ways. And then when we start thinking about reframing the question or the idea of aging, I think it's very important to think about and, and consider that aging and need go hand in hand in people's thoughts, but that we need to understand that aging and older adults also provide opportunities. And I want to extend that through the age kind of spectrum too. So there's been incredible work with Multnomah County, with the City of Portland and getting youth commissions going. There's also aging and disability service advisory groups. All of these groups are important. They all contribute in a number of ways. So I think the important thing on the aging side to think about during a time where our natural resources are dwindling, right? Clean air, clean water, peak oil. We have a growing natural resource, which is the aging of our population, older adults who have a lot to bring to the table. So flipping the need-based to the asset-based is a real important part of the communication um, that we hope to promote and push forward. I also want to point out that some of these conversations that we're having need to touch on the cultural. Um, depending upon where you come from, what your family is about, um, in, in our particular family as African Americans and as Southerners, we value um, the elders in our family. Um, they lead the way. Um, not too long ago, I lost my dad. He was 90 years old, and he was the last one. And someone asked me, how does it feel to be at the front of the line? Mm -hmm. And I, I actually was startled by that. I'm an elder in my family now. And, and I'm proud to be an elder because the alternative, as Alan just shared with you, is not so great. So I think that as my children age and they have children and those children grow up, I want them not to be afraid of aging. I want them to embrace it. And I want them to be encouraged by the fact that 
They stand on the shoulders of people who have done some pretty darn great things. But we have to begin to work together and to share those things that we have in common in culture and in community and in neighborhoods. And I think we're all kind of grappling with how do we pull it all together? And I, I appreciate the data um, that we're receiving because I think that without data, a lot of people are lost because we need that data and we need the oral history. We need all of those things to go together to build better communities. So Alan, talk a little bit about um, how does this fit um, in the reframing of aging in getting national attention for, for Portland and for Oregon and all the work that's been done? Because you've, you've got like a treasure trove of information. And I, I think that as we think about what kinds of things we've done here in Portland, talk more specifically about how that translates across the nation and then across the ocean. Well, I, I think I'd like to start with this idea that um, if, I, if I could get you all thinking and maybe channeling uh, Dr. Kushel, who I, I heard speak yesterday about aging and homelessness, housing, housing, housing. Right. We need not only affordable housing, but accessible housing. And I'd say we're making inroads here locally. Uh, we've got a long way to go before we get to where we need to be. But this is a national level issue. And I know that colleagues of mine across the seas, in the UK in particular, are facing some similar issues. Um, not only do we have abundant housing that is not used by folks, but we don't have systems and payments that are kind of keeping up with our needs in a number of ways. And even sometimes when we have great affordable housing, folks with varying abilities can't get into them. And so in my opinion, I think we should have more universally designed affordable housing across that spectrum of or bandwidths of affordability from that zero to 30% of median family income all the way up to, to folks who are you know, able to pay at market rate, but who would like to age in their home and in their community. I think in many ways, it, it boils down to that piece, which is aging in community. I'd say if we can, and Ruby, you did a great job today of helping me rethink this, that the work around age-friendly is not about just technical fixes, but it's about building community back up. And one of the big issues that we are facing is social isolation. So housing, social connection, social isolation, I think are, are some of the most important kind of US and transnational issues that we're facing. Thank you. Um, I, somebody just passed me a note, and I just wanted to touch on this as well. I've been thinking about it for a little bit. Um, when we start talking about the cultural impact of the things that we're doing um, in our state, especially in a state like Oregon and a city like Portland, what are we doing um, here as it relates to our migrant populations? And are they being included in data sets? So Alan, talk a little bit about that, if you would. It's, it, <clears throat> I'm representing the industry here, everyone, so uh, let me choke up here for a moment. Uh, we're, we're challenged, quite frankly. Doing our kind of work is more difficult than ever before. It's just uh, getting increasingly uh, difficult, uh, more costly, to reach a representative cross-section of Oregonians. Uh, we work real hard uh, at it, uh, and we're still able to do it. When it comes to reaching uh, those populations, those hard to reach populations, it's very challenging. Uh, but it can be done. Uh, but it takes time, it takes expense, and quite frankly, it takes uh, what I uh, refer to in my colleagues a variety of techniques or hybrid sampling to reach them, including working with community partners uh, to reach them. Uh, these groups um, are sometimes very reluctant to uh, participate in, in uh, uh, surveys, for example, to show up at focus uh, groups. I, I cannot tell you the, the uh, actual fear that Latinas and Latinos have uh, when uh, being recruited for a focus group, you know, what's this all about? Who are you? No, I'm not interested. We want to hear from them. We want them to be given an opportunity to, to be here, uh, to be heard. So uh, challenges, Ruby, 
but they can be overdone, but we need uh, help. We need help from community organizations out there to open the door for us. Well, I appreciate that answer, and, and uh, AARP is here to help. Absolutely. You guys have been great. <laughs> so when we start talking about what kinds of things we can do in community, um, one of the nice things that we've had an opportunity to do in AARP, and actually um, Bandana uh, Shrestha took me a couple of days ago over to the Asian Community um, Health Center. Brand new facility, um, actually a three-tiered um, concept that I fell in love with. Um, there's a mental health clinic on the main floor, um, a federally qualified health center, and then it moves up to a community-based um, environment for community folks and, and elders. I saw people playing ping pong together. They serve 400 meals a day there that are culturally appropriate meals. And the people who were there, the seniors who were there playing ping pong, we learned were 90 years old. I was absolutely impressed, wanted to take my jacket off and participate. <laughs> so I guess what I can tell you is that we're here, we're in Portland, we're outside of Portland, and the cultural diversity um, in this city is phenomenal. It's not just food people. <laughs> it's important for us to get out and visit and spend the time so that we can learn about what's going on in community. So let me just move to another question that I, that I have. Um, when we focus on age, um, what do you see going on with other demographics related to values and beliefs about age-friendly communities? It's a real good uh, question, Ruby. Um, one thing for all of us to keep in mind is uh, a particular generation we'll find subgroup differences in, in opinions within that generation. Uh, one of the bigger ones between women and, and men. Uh, that's the one uh, I, uh, over the years, have, have seen to be most uh, significant. Uh, another one, uh, putting aside uh, uh, area of, of the state, which will we'll see some differences, but everyone, not as many as you might think. And I want to make this point real clear here. Uh, you hear a lot about the urban-rural divide in this state. I don't care if you're someone living on the coast, in Central Oregon, Eastern Oregon, Willamette Valley, in a neighborhood in Portland, Oregon, or in a small community in Southeast Oregon, you share the same values about living in Oregon. The same kinds of issues are of concern to you. You value the same public services. You care about small business and you care about the future of uh, low-income children and, and seniors. We have that in common. Where the divide is, everyone, and it has to be qualified, where the divide is our attitudes about governance our attitudes about public finance. That's where the divide is. But I would encourage all of us with issues like age-friendly communities, with issues about uh, young people growing up in this uh, community, us continuing to grow uh, older, uh, to build on what it is that we have in, in common. And uh, a lot of times, if people have an opportunity to exchange and uh, learn that they do have this stuff in common. A lot of progress could be made on the governance end of stuff and on the public finance end of stuff. Alan? Yeah, just a couple of thoughts on about age, and I apologize for my language here, but a colleague of mine, Michael Deshane, had said, age is a crappy variable, right? It really doesn't tell you a lot about the people who you're talking about. Um, and I'll dig a little deeper here. I, I, I think it's important to note that we as gerontologists need to define what age is in every project that we do. It's important for entitlements from the Age Discrimination and Employment Act and the protections there all the way to Medicare and Medicaid. It's, it's very important to understand where people are on, their, on the age continuum. But a couple of things to, to dig deeper into. Um, 
somebody at 60 could be running a marathon or they could be bed bound, right? So the age 60 doesn't tell you a lot about those individuals. As I learned yesterday, uh, for a homeless individual who is aged 50, we should probably be thinking about them in the terms of the functional ability of a 75-year-old or somebody in their 70s and 80s. So we need to think a little bit differently about age. Yes, it's an important number, but it doesn't always describe and explain what's happening in communities. So you know, that being said, we can have incredible contributors throughout the age spectrum. And so while I do, as a gerontologist, study folks from midlife and beyond, I kind of think and question sometimes, what does the number mean? So, you know, it's okay to, I think, question things that are important numbers for us. Well, for our radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Ruby Houghton Pitts, the State Director of AARP Oregon. I'm here today with Adam Davis of the DHM Research and Alan De La Torre from Portland State's Institute on Aging. We're gonna go to questions now. We have some people over at the microphone. Please state your name and briefly tell us your question. Mary Bogle, City Club member. My question is largely addressed to Alan, I believe, but I'd love to hear from um, all of you uh, <clears throat> about how you would handle this situation. I live in downtown Portland, thankfully, uh, where I don't own a car. And um, I'm on Southwest 12th, which is uh, um, a street with uh, most of the low-income housing in downtown, um, and most of the diversity otherwise, racial and income, et cetera. Uh, it um, uh, has at least four treeless asphalt deserts, also known as sur surface parking lots around it. Um, walking up the, this street at any time of year is unpleasant to say the least, but in... Um, uh, Your question, uh, please. 105 degrees and smoky, Thank you. it's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. um, the mm -hmm. Peabot plan to make this a greenway was hijacked by some downtown development interest. Mm -hmm. And most recently... I'd love to talk to you more, but can you please give us your question? Thank you. Yeah, well, it, I'm asking for how you would handle this situation. Most recently, the Neighborhood Association was hijacked by a group from um, the uh, largest condominium building in downtown. So, Alan, yeah. can you answer that, please? Yeah, uh, Mary, I, I think you're pointing out some of the incredible complexities that we have in, in planning for and, and implementing not only policy around age-friendly, but in general, city, county, and, and regional and state policies as well. Uh, you know, aspects of urban heat islands and some of the parking lots are, are quite interesting, and there are some technical solutions that are somewhat better than what we have now. Uh, the urban greenway or the, the, the you know, greenway idea is to get more folks who would be riding bikes and, and pedestrian, pedestrian activity on those areas. Um, channel Bandana here and thinking about approaches to complete streets and making sure that we've got not only street furniture, but other trees and other types of, of foliage that might protect folks. Um, you know, I think that there is a challenge for all of us in thinking about um, affordable housing in our neighborhood versus somebody else's neighborhood. And I know that you're talking about an area that has a, a, a large focus of affordable housing units. Um, but downtown is, is a rich place, access to service, access to transportation, to, to food, um, all of these things are, are quite important. Um, and I'd say that really your question is what Age Friendly is partially trying to do. It's working through local government, working with local business, finding people who can be involved and engaged in the conversation. So um, it's not a quick fix, but these are things that we're in it for the long haul and trying to think through with people, you know, at the table, how can we improve this? I met recently with some folks from Peabot and talking about more age-friendly design, and there's some new thinking. It's, it's great to kick around ideas. Um, but I, I appreciate your, your insight as well as, as the question, and I, I'm sorry I can't answer with a great, let's, here's the one or two year plan to get this done. I think that it's, it's the long, long range approach that we need to take with some of this. Work with you and students at PSU to help 
resolve this question. So I'll be in touch. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Thank you very much. Your question, please. Your name and your question. Hi, I'm Joyce DeMonin, City Club member, and thank you, panel, for a great discussion today. One thing we haven't discussed yet is a hot topic on age-friendly, and that is the opportunity to have economic uh, stability and thrive as you get older. And um, so can we dis discuss the other ism that I think sometimes gets um, lost in the shuffle, which is ageism. Um, as Adam noted in his comments, over 60% of people say that they've seen or experienced um, ageism in the workplace. Um, and that's kind of a sad state of affairs in our state right now. Uh, what, how does the age-friendly movement or work address the last big ism that sometimes gets shuffled off, right? That we don't, it's, we don't talk about. Did you notice that at, Adam pointed to me. <laughs> That's ground level. <laughs> well, I, I think it's more than ground level. I think that in other states, we actually there are actually laws that speak to ageism. And in Oregon, we've dealt with sexism, we've dealt with race racism, and we've dealt with other isms. But when we tried this legislative session to address ageism with a bill, that would actually stop people from doing this in the workplace and impacting negatively people's income as they age, we didn't get the bill through. So everyone who's sitting here who's aging, which means every single one of us, needs to take this on as a personal and a professional issue so that this next time the Oregon legislature will actually move forward a bill that will stop ageism in the workplace. There should be penalties for that. We shouldn't be telling bad jokes about people as they age in the workplace. We should not be pulling out people's resumes and making a decision because they graduated in a certain year that they're not capable of doing a job for which they can do. Now this is something that each and every one of us should take an interest in. Because if you live to see tomorrow, you're going to get older. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Carlos Romo. I'm a volunteer for ARP. You've talked a lot, a lot about new ideas and different ideas. But one thing I haven't heard is what kind of economic impact do people that are aging have on the state? And we need to change a lot of things about that because people think that uh, Older people stay home and don't spend any money, uh, but in fact, we are an economic power to be reckoned. So what can we do about that? Uh, just a, a few things. Uh, I, this is a, well, first and foremost, if you're interested in learning more about the economic issues around age-friendly, I'd say take a look at the longevity economy, some work that's been done from, from Eco Northwest, uh, the case for age-friendly communities, which is something that Margaret, uh, Neil, and I wrote in 2016, I believe, where we tried to bring 300 academic references and gray literature together to kind of answer some of these questions. But a couple quick takeaways that I think are important. First, people aged 50 and older are much more successful at entrepreneurial activities than younger individuals, right? That's a, an important kind of piece. I'd say that the skills that older adults bring to the table include these kind of three things that are, I think, important to employers, um, speaking well, reading well, and writing well, right? Kind of important things for, for jobs in general. Uh, I'd say that age-friendly tourism is an important arena for us to look at. Travel Portland, Travel Oregon, are you listening? Uh, th those are opportunities that are, are really quite um, at the forefront, at least of my mind, uh, at the moment. So. Um, this idea of the longevity economy and understanding the economic clout that older adults not only have as consumers, but the opportunities that could be driven by the skills, expertise, and capital of older adults is something that we don't really embrace and understand as, as communities as well as we need to. Right. And volunteers and the contributions that folks are making in other ways, unpaid caregiving, those things are not always included in things like gross domestic product, but are, are critical for moving our economies forward. Think about grandparents raising grandchildren. There are so many things that, yeah, that I think we could dig deeper into, but uh, thanks, Carlos, for the question. Yeah. Great question. Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you. 
uh, Joyce Schoberg, and I own a local care management firm. And one of our roles for our adult disabled and older adult client and their families is to locate and secure um, areas which are both visually appropriate, auditorially appropriate, and uh, uh, appropriate as well for mobility challenges. And we are sometimes challenged to find both those restaurants, um, social spaces, theaters, um, and parks for those uh, needs of our clients. Do you have any uh, enlightenment um, and potential future hope uh, for that? And I know it goes towards design, but also working with um, a variety of different agencies. I'm happy to take this. It's, yeah. yeah. I, from the design perspective, I think there are a few things that are important to note. Um, we have changing physical attributes and abilities as, as we age. Um, people are at, uh, along the ability spectrum as well that's really important to note. But some simple things to think about, like um, wayfinding and signage that could be helpful for individuals, um, understanding that the lenses of our eyes yellow over time and that having uh, yellow on green or white on yellow is actually hard for people to see the design of things like benches where people can rest. Um, like this chair is a great example, right? It's got good armrests, it's got a back, and it's got a place where I can put my feet underneath the seat. Try standing up with your feet two or three inches in front of you. It's really quite difficult. And so even though sometimes we've got this wonderful art that's there for public use in public spaces, it's not always designed for use. So I think the utilitarian perspective is, is really quite important. And I'd say that one of the, the key things, as maybe the final takeaway here, is that the best design is actually um, integrated design that brings people who are end users into the process to say, how do you, a uh, person who is in the blind, low vision community or deaf and hard of hearing community, experience this space and how could we improve it for, for you, or people in mobility devices? I don't think that we always do a good job of, A, including folks in the process and B, including them at the right time in the process where we can make changes to those, those designs before they're kind of set in stone or, or in motion. Hello, my name is Mary Lee Wright. I'm a city club member. Um, my questions, I wrote them down because so I don't go on and ramble and I get to the question. Um, so, um, I am a former, uh, I was a workforce analyst economist for the state of Oregon for 12 years, so I studied you know, demographics. I'm a, I'm a geek, and so I actually am interested in doing some of this work uh, about aging and place and such. Um, here's the, the question. I'm 55 years old, and I have started considering <laughs> where I'm going to live when I age. I have no children. Um, I am from Southern Oregon. I'm from actually Portland. I'm a native Oregonian. So I've spent a great deal of time in Southern Oregon. It's beautiful. Aesthetically, I'd rather be there. But uh, 10 years ago, I reinvented myself and I started working in social services. I worked for uh, Senior and Disabled Services in Medford, Oregon. I had a caseload of 100 people. Right. And now I've worked as a health coach in the Pearl in Portland with the same demographic, but a lot more affluent. So, my concerns when you said the divide is government in and rural your question? versus yes, my okay. rural versus ur urban. What is being done? See, I think the the transportation issues for seniors in rural communities is Come huge. Question. So, what is being done for that? Because I saw my clients who were just out there in long distances away suffering and they were dependent on some relative that may or may not want to take care of them. That's an excellent question. Is, <clears throat> go ahead. If either of you have, would like to. Um, Adam, go ahead. Great question. Uh, it's another thing we have in common, okay? Uh, whether you're in Southern Oregon or in the Portland area, in Eastern Oregon, or again on the coast, uh, there are issues like that that people care about. Uh, and transportation, just public transportation, uh, there is great demand for transportation options uh, throughout Oregon, including rural Oregon. It's not just about uh, the automobile, uh, which what? It represents a lot of expense uh, to an individual or, or a household. But it's about public transit and it's about accessible transportation as well. And 
that's what I was getting at. Because I see my seniors, I, I train people that are in their 90s. They go on the streetcar. Mm -hmm. They can be at home. Right. Uh, they can go to their doctor appointments. Those same people probably wouldn't be able to stay in their home in Southern Oregon. And I'm talking about public transportation, too. Because, right. you know, I remember when they got a bus. It only goes on two highways. <laughs> so that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Subsidies by the state, more money. To say <clears throat> Thank a, a you. Urban more. Area. You're right. More money, more work, more effort on our part. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, yeah. Hi, Alan. Hi, Grace. Uh, I'm uh, Grace Gray Minnis Nigel Reed. I uh, am a broadcaster for KBU Radio Disability Awareness. I've had Alan on my show. Thank you. Good seeing you again. Okay. So here's what I want to say, and I'm a member of DSAC and a whole bunch of other volunteer deals. I'm uh, 77 or 78 or something like that, and I'm 90 inside because I have MS and my body's displaying out as a 90-year-old, and I may not have very much time on this planet, so it's good to be at this mic. Um, I work with homeless, housing issues uh, on a daily basis, and I work with addiction issues on a daily basis with uh, the houseless, the homeless, Kenton Village, Hazelnut Grove. I know, I know. <laughs> so, and that's part of the problem. We don't have time. I know this is a thing. Okay, so here's the deal from, uh, I have a master's degree, I have a PhD, so I'm well educated. The question is this. Well, I'll put it in question form. First, I have to state this. People uh, that, that need to hear you and be part of this right here today are absolutely frightened to death to come anywhere near authority figures. You guys. So, Ms. Grace, please ask your question because we're almost out of time. Why? And I want to talk to you after this yeah, for sure. Please. Why is it so hard to break the barrier and the gaps? between the people that need to come, that you're actually trying to help, and they need to come to you, but they can't, or they won't, or something. And DSAC has been going crazy trying to break that barrier. What are, do you have any insight yeah. on what the barrier is, and how can people like me yeah. be, be the uh, bridge between you as authorities, you know? You're already there. Yeah. And so bring it up, bring it up, and go out into the community to reach people. I don't go and sit in my office or sit in my home. I go out, and I would challenge each and every one of you to go out and bring someone. Each one teach one, and each one bring one. Thank you so much. Um, for what you said, because I think it's absolutely essential that we get off our duffs and get some of this work done. Thank you. Thank you. And with that challenge, our time is up, and we'll have to pause the conversation for now. We are grateful for everyone who's made today's forum possible. Thank you in particular to Leslie Moorhead for producing today's pro program, to Adam Allen Ruby for helping us understand the Portland region's livability and to the Multnomah County Aging, Disability, and Veterans Services Division for sponsoring today's program. Thank you so much. We are adjourned. Thank you.